Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Let's see if people can hear me. Hello, happy Friday. Oh, okay, great. You guys can hear me. Do I sound like I'm in a tunnel or is it this, is it better? I know last week I sounded kind of weird in the beginning. This is good. Okay, great. Happy Friday. Um, do, do we have anybody who's new? Like, is this your first time on the group today? I wonder. I think we may we may all just have been here for some time. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, today is an important chapter. Oh, <laughs> okay, all of the chapters are important. We've gone over this, but yes, we're going over occupational health and we're gonna start off with some questions, okay? So we're doing five questions and then we're going um, over occupational health and then the group member spotlight is actually, should, be, should have been deleted, so that's my bad. Okay, so let's start with question one. You have been notified by the director of the emergency department that several employees were exposed to a patient confirmed to have pulmonary tuberculosis. After you confirm that the employees were exposed, what should be done next? Exclude employees from work until they are confirmed non-infectious. Administer, sorry, B, administer the tuberculin skin test and repeat skin test in 12 weeks. C, Provide an in-service to the emergency department staff on personal protective equipment and isolation precautions for patients sus suspected to have pulmonary TB. And D, administer the TST and perform a chest radiograph on all exposed employees. Go ahead and take some time. Okay, so we have primarily everyone choosing B, but a couple other people have chosen D um, and A. So there's a little bit of um, variance, but the majority of our group is choosing B, which, um, which is the correct answer. Administer the tuberculin skin test and repeat the skin test in 12 weeks. That's going to be the recommendation anytime you have um, an employee that's exposed. So exclude employees from work until they are confirmed non-infectious. Why is A not a good answer choice? Exclude employees from work until they are confirmed non-infectious. Jessica, you have you have it. She said, Jessica Castillo said, they may not show some signs and symptoms right away. That's correct. We have a little bit of an incubation period with this one, so there could be a significant amount of time that passes before they even develop any symptoms. So how long are we gonna be excluding people for? Uh, provide an in-service to the emergency department staff on personal protective equipment and isolation precautions for patients suspected to have pulmonary TV. You can definitely do that. Um, that that's even a good idea to do after you have an exposure, um, but it's most definitely not going to be your primary concern right away. Education is always important. Obviously, you want to do as much education as you can before the event happens. That's an option, but it's it, it's not really going to be one of your very next steps to do. Um, and then administer the TST and perform a chest radiograph on all exposed employees. Why would we not be per... Sorry, can you hear me? Oh, Elizabeth is on the call. I can't stay on the call, but I passed the exam on Wednesday. I would be happy to come back and talk about my experience. Thank you. Your course helped tremendously. Oh, congratulations, Elizabeth. That's amazing. Congratulations. That's fantastic. Okay, well, enjoy your Friday, but thank you for letting us know. Um, sorry, that just warms my heart. It's so nice when our 
you know, our group members get to pass. It's it's just so nice. I remember the relief after I, I passed my test, so I'm sure she's relieved. Um, okay, Smitha, you're correct. So radiograph if any symptoms. Okay, perfect. So we do have um we have um we have some ideas on why those are the correct answers. Now, I always tell you, please, if you can, try to narrow down your choices. So that's why I like to go through some of the answers and be like, well, you know, can we narrow this down? Because if you can narrow it down, you're just, you're closer to getting the right answer. Okay, so rationale, if there has been unprotected exposure to TB, TSD should be administered at the time of the exposure and repeated at 12 weeks post-exposure to look for possible converters. Chest radiographs are performed only on those with prior positive TSTs and who are currently symptomatic. So good job, Smitha said that. Question two, you receive an incident report that states a pediatric, sorry, a pediatric nurse received an exposure. The report is incomplete. It states that the nurse was scratched by a needle in a patient's room while she was spiking an IV bag. You cannot tell at, the, at what point the exposure occurred or the type of needle involved. Your first reaction should be, A, determine if correct personal protective equipment was used or improper technique used. B, determine if the source patient is infectious or high risk for bloodborne infectious diseases. C, determine who the source patient was and what his or her medical diagnosis was. And D, determine if a blood or body fluid exposure actually occurred. Okay, gonna give you guys like another second. <clears throat> Alrighty, so we have um the majority of the group is saying D, but we do have some people who are saying it could be C, it could be A, or it could be B. So all answer choices were selected. Okay, so when it comes to exposures, now, for those of us who are infection preventionists currently working right now in a hospital, we know that exposures take a significant amount of work, right? I mean, it's a whole situation station. You have to figure out when it occurred, how it occurred, did it, what is the patient's status. Um, you need to speak with the, um, with the healthcare provider. And after all of that, there's like a chain of like it's like a chain reaction like oh okay I did this I did this I need to call employee health I need to send in um, this type of report blah 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 so since we know that this takes a lot of work one of the very first things that we're going to need to do is to determine if a blood or body fluid exposure actually occurred the way that this question is written really guides you to the correct answer um, uh, okay, yes, sorry, somebody just put something in the chat. I will email you. Um, it guides you to the correct answer. So they're saying the report is incomplete. It states the nurse was scratched by a needle in a patient's room while she was spiking an IV bag. You cannot tell at what point the exposure occurred or the type of needle involved. This is very muddy. It's muddled. You can't really tell, okay, well, what kind of exposure was it? Um, when did it occur, etc. So you need to, the first thing you need to do is determine if a blood or body fluid exposure actually occurred. Now, these other things are things that you would do um, if you have an actual exposure, but they love to do, I'm sorry, they love to ask you questions about what is the best answer choice? What would you do first? which is the most important. They want to know what your, um, what your critical thinking skills are like. Can you critically work through these questions and identify the correct answer and what you need to do first? So just be very mindful of when you're seeing these, um, 
these words like your first, most important, um, the best, like, et cetera, it means you have to really make sure you're thinking about the question. Because I can see why you guys would want to select the other ones, but the correct answer is to determine if a blood or body fluid exposure actually occurred. So good job for those who chose D. Transmission of bloodborne pathogens from patients to healthcare workers is an important occupational hazard. The risk of bloodborne pathogen transmission following occupational exposure depends on a variety of factors, including source patient factors, the type of injury and quantity of blood or body fluid transferred to the healthcare worker during the exposure, and the healthcare worker's immune status. Before any further action should be taken, the IP should collect further data on the incident to verify the presence of an occupational exposure. Yeah, so we have, <laughs> we just got a comment from one of our, our group members, Latarsha, hopefully I said that right. Um, she says, this happened to me yesterday. I received a page about an exposure. I got the page at around 4.30 p.m. and finished the investigation at 10 p.m. Luckily, there was no exposure. So see, this is why they're asking us this question, because it's the, it's the truth. I mean, these scenarios and these issues do come up. Okay, question three. A new employee to your facility is foreign born and received the Bacillus Kalmet-Garen vaccine as a child, BCG. Her pre-employment assessment for tuberculosis should include A, a two-step PPD as any other employee would receive, B, no purified protein derivative due to BCG vaccine, C, chest x-ray to rule out active TV, or D, one PPD, sorry, one PPD due to BCG vaccine. Okay, so we've basically, we had every single answer choice selected for this one. So a tuberculin skin test should be administered to all new employees, then read and interpreted by trained personnel. Use of the intradermal Mantu method to administer the PPD-based TST. Tying tests should not be used. Baseline screening should be conducted at the time of hire. So it looks like we need to go over um, tuberculosis a bit more. And you want to know something? One thing is that last time um, when we were supposed to cover tuberculosis, I'm trying to remember which other disease I had paired that one up with, but I didn't have enough time to cover um, TB. So I think next week, I know we definitely need to cover pregnant healthcare workers. Sorry, let me quickly just get my life together. So next week we have Bordetella pertussis and herpes virus. Okay. Okay, we, we're gonna cover um, TV, TV a bit today, but uh, I'm gonna try to find some more resources because I know tuberculosis is one of the more difficult chapters because there's so much information, but it is really important for the test, uh, like extremely important. You're gonna have uh, quite a bit of questions on TV. I know I did. Question four, during an in-service program for new employees, the IP describes how hepatitis B and HIV are transmitted. A major difference in the epidemiology of the two diseases is, A, the ease of transmission through needle punctures, B, the potential for airborne transmission, C, presence of the causative agent in various body fluids, or D, the ability of the disease to be transmitted during sexual intercourse. Let me give you some time. Okay, so we have, 
a lot of different ooh, okay we have a lot of different answer choices we have quite a bit of a's but we have a lot of c's some d's sprinkled some d's sprinkled in it's like <laughs> it's just every every yeah we have a lot of different answer choices so you're doing an in-service you're doing education for your new employees which is really fun okay i love orientation orientation is so much fun i get to talk about nails and hand hygiene it's just it's one of my favorite times um and I also get to meet some of our new nurses, so it's just so, it's so fun. So the IP describes how hepatitis B and HIV are transmitted. A major difference in the epidemiology of the two diseases is. Now, think about your audience, right? So first thing, think about your audience. You are talking to your employees. One of the very first things we should be able to get rid of is this one, the ability of the disease to be transmitted during sexual intercourse, right? So already, those of you who selected D, I want you to start thinking of another option that is more applicable to this. Now, the presence of the causative agent in various body fluids, sure, you could discuss that, um, but that might not necessarily be the most important thing for you to discuss during an in-service for new employees. The potential for airborne transmission, automatically, right? You should have been already down to, it's either A or C. So if we are between the ease of transmission through needle punctures and the presence of the causative agent in various body fluids, one of those is the most important and it's A, the ease of transmission through needle punctures. The risk, of transmission for these infectious diseases when it comes to needle punctures significantly varies, right? So it's a significant difference. If I have hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, wow, okay, that I need some help. <laughs> Which one, which one of those am I going to be um, the most concerned about as far as transmission through a needle stick? Which one has the highest percentage? Okay. So I'm getting um, different answers. So hep B, hep C, least transmission is HIV. All right, so what this question is asking you is do you know your risk when it comes to needle sticks? That's what they want you to know. That's what they wanna make sure that you know. The risk, so prevention of occupational blood exposure is the primary way to reduce transmission of hep B, hep C, and HIV. The risk of hep B virus Zero conversion after a percutaneous injury ranges from 23 to 62%. All right, that's really high. The average risk of zero conversion after a percutaneous injury involving hepatitis C, 1.8%. And the risk of HIV transmission via percutaneous injury is 0.3%. So you can see how in this question, they are testing your knowledge on occupational exposures, zero conversion, and which disease is the riskiest. So it's a lot. They're asking a lot on this question for you to know a lot, but um, it, the answer is A, the ease of transmission through needle punctures. I hope that makes sense. Question five, during educational in-service um, in pediatric, to, sorry, to pediatric, I'm, I'm having issues with pediatricians and pediatric people today. Like, <laughs> all right, during an educational in-service to pediatric nurses, the IP is asked how to manage a patient with cytomegalovirus. The correct precautions include, A, assigning non-pregnant nurses to care for CMV infected children, B, following standard precautions, C, cohorting all children with CMV, or D, using droplet precautions. All right, so it's going to be following standard precautions. 
Cytomegalovirus, or CMV, infects between 50% and 80% of persons in the United States by 40 years of age. For most healthy persons who acquire CMV after birth, there are few symptoms and no long-term health consequences. For the majority of people, CMV infection is not considered is not considered a serious health problem. Groups that are at high risk for serious complications include infants infected in utero or during delivery and immunocompromised persons. Standard precautions in healthcare settings are adequate for preventing transmission of CMV between patients and staff. Routine screening of patients for cytomegalovirus infection is not recommended. All right, so, this one is a big one when it comes to your uh, chapter 15, sorry, is it 15 pregnant healthcare or one of, I can't remember, the pregnant healthcare chapter. They talk about cytomegalovirus, so it can cause some issues, like, like it says here, for infants infected in utero, in utero or during delivery. So if you have a patient that um, has cytomegalovirus, you could potentially have a pregnant nurse saying, please, like I would like to change assignments. Cytomegalovirus isn't something that we regularly screen for or test for, et cetera. So it, it's it's really difficult to say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move your assignment to somebody else um, because we don't know what that person's status may be. So at least in that, in that, um, at least in that case, you you already know that that person has cytomegalovirus, and you can take all the necessary precautions by following your standard precautions with these patients. Um, but I do know mama bears, you know, our pregnant healthcare workers definitely get really concerned about um, infectious diseases when they're pregnant, and it makes it makes sense. But you just need to be able to have a conversation with them and help explain to them why standard precautions are. Um, you know, recommended, et cetera, et cetera, go over potential, you know, exposures. You, It just takes that one-on-one -on -one communication. You need to be able to go up to your unit and have a face-to-face -face with that person and calm them down and make them feel better. Be compassionate, be kind, but you got to know your stuff, right? You can't just go up there all willy-nilly without your facts because then they'll eat you alive, right? It is what it is. That's how. That's how it is. You have to know your stuff. Okay, so occupational health. What a time, what a time, okay? How many of you during COVID-19 ended up getting, you know, getting assigned employee health duties on your campus or on your facility? Ugh, it's the madness, the madness. It's crazy, it was crazy. It was crazy at the height of things when we were working on um, exposures, um, employee interviews, notifications. IP was doing a lot of that in the beginning. I mean, Smitha says she was as well. So for some of us, this occupational health chapter became very much real life to us during this pandemic. And um, I was speaking with one of my colleagues, CJ Shannon out at Indiana. He's fantastic, and um, one of the things that we were talking about was for almost half of our time at our respective facilities, we've been doing COVID, you know, it's been pandemic response. And he was like, I can't imagine like how it must be for other people right now. We've learned so much in just the past couple of months since this started. Um, and I 100% I agree with it. I'm sure there's a lot of you who have learned a lot too. So occupational health, let's try to speed it up because I have talked a lot today. I'm just feeling real chatty. I don't know what's going on. It's Friday. I'm just feeling, I don't know. I'm feeling a little sussy today. I don't know what's going on. So occupational health. Um, elements of an occupational health program include surveillance, education, immunization, and injury prevention and response. Those are all of the elements which are really important. The occupational health program and infection preventionists work collaboratively to implement pre-exposure vaccination programs, particular, particularly those that are required annually, post-exposure intervention responses, and other program activities to prevent exposure to infectious diseases. Work restrictions in the healthcare facility related to communicable diseases must be clearly outlined in policy and enforcement accountability methods built into the process. 
background. An infection preventionist has a vital role within the organization in identifying risk of communicable diseases to the patient and healthcare personnel, assessing the potential adverse outcomes, implementing pre-exposure and post-exposure policies and procedures, and evaluating the effectiveness of measures taken. Recommended practices need to be based on the epidemiology of infectious disease transmission in the healthcare facility targeting the healthcare personnel as a potential source or host. Now, uh, when the pandemic first started, I know that there was a lot of collaboration um, higher up in leadership, right? So our director of infection prevention for our system was working very closely with employee health to ensure that infection prevention was involved in all of those discussions when it came to exposures, etc. Another big department that I feel like they don't really touch on um, in this chapter is human resources. So human resources is tied into our employee health programs. And I, I mean, think about uh, paid like, are you going to get paid? All of this stuff is tied into human resources. And I developed, um, I feel like I developed a closer relationship with our HR department because of that. I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but, you know, I'm just saying. Basic principles. Some infectious processes that present a possible threat to healthcare personnel may be prevented with administration of pre-exposure immunizations. Other infectious processes caused by communicable diseases may have specific indications for post-exposure interventions. Yet, some infectious processes may be prevented primarily by prevention strategies. So what basically what that bullet point is telling you is, there's some things that we can vaccinate for, there's some things that our infection prevention, bread and butter, standard precautions, gloves, PP, et cetera, are gonna be able to help you with. Um, and then there's some things that after you've been exposed, there are steps that we can take to help, um, you know, mitigate the risk. So to help um, administering, okay, example, tetanus, right? Tetanus vaccine. Let me tell you what, you want, you want me to tell you a story? Let me tell you a story. Luz has had to file um, a report with employee health. And I'm going to tell you right now what happened last year. So here I am getting ready for DNV to come to campus and guess who is out here removing tape with a rusty blade. Now, I'm not going to say that I should have been smarter because to me, I was just being dedicated to getting this tape off of all of our devices and equipment, etc. But anyway, um, I, yeah, I caught myself. <laughs> <laughs> while removing tape <laughs> with a rusty blade and then I had to file a report and I had to go get my tetanus shot. So this is an example of all of these different strategies when it comes to occupational health. Now, it probably has not happened to other people on the call, but maybe that will help, that will remind you of some things that we would do for post, as a post-exposure intervention. Um, okay, so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines the term healthcare personnel as all paid and unpaid persons working in healthcare settings who have the potential for exposure to infectious materials, including body substances, contaminated medical supplies and equipment, contaminated environmental surfaces, or contaminated air. Records. Maintenance of records, data management, and confidentiality are major requirements by federal, state, and local standards of the Occupational Health Program. A computerized personnel database is preferred. Copies of individual records are to be made available to personnel on request. This, yeah, so this is extremely important. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting when it came to um, specifically this pandemic was your FIT testing information. So how many of you guys have all of your N95s fit testing results um, just readily available in a database. Like you're able to go in and pull everybody's information up on the computer. You're not having to do like a manual lookup, pulling, you know, opening drawers, paper documentation. So yeah, we have some variants. We have some people who say, yeah, we had um, we have compu a computerized program, but there's a lot of you who don't. 
some are in folders, some on our, some are online. Yeah. So I mean, I'm. This was a this was a situation, right? I think we're going to be thinking about um, our our storage of records differently after this pandemic when it comes to occupational health, or at least I hope facilities are having discussions about it and talking about it at minimum. Because when you need this information, you need it right away. You can't tell me to try to figure out where it's at. Okay, so in, oh, this is important. Okay, when you see objectives, objectives, when you're reading the text and they're talking about objectives, key components, those kind of words should stick out and you should want to remember what they're referring to. So infection prevention objectives of an occupational health program, you need to know these objectives. Here they are. Educate healthcare personnel about the principles of infection prevention and their individual responsibility for infection prevention. Collaborate with the infection prevention and control department in monitoring and investigating potentially harmful infectious exposures and outbreaks. Provide care to personnel for work-related illnesses or exposures. Identify work-related infection risks and institute appropriate preventative measures, sorry, preventative measures, contain costs by preventing infectious diseases that result in absenteeism and disability. So those are your objectives. How many of them are there? One, two, three, four, five. So we have five objectives. All right, so let's see who was listening. <laughs> Which of the following is not an infection prevention objective of an occupational health program? A, contain costs by preventing infectious diseases that result in absenteeism and disability. B, provide care to personnel for work-related illnesses or exposures. C, educate patients about the principles of infection prevention. Or D, Collaborate with the Infection Prevention Department in monitoring and investigating potentially harmful infectious exposures and outbreaks. Okay, we're getting a lot of the same answers, which is good. We're getting a lot of C's, which is right. Educate the patients about the principles of infection prevention. Now, that would seem, that would make sense, right? You would think about it and be like, yeah, no, obviously we need to educate our patients about the principles of infection prevention, but it's not applicable to um, our occupational health program because our occupational health program focuses on who? Our healthcare personnel. So we are educating our healthcare personnel about the principles of infection prevention and their individual responsibility for infection prevention. So the correct answer um, is not this one because it's saying which of the following is not. Yeah, so boom, right? Oh, somebody said tricky. Yeah, well, you know, this is the thing. They're going to trick you. That's why I'm trying to point out the way they're going to trick you when you get to the test so that they don't trick you because they're sneaky with their questions. So you just have to make sure that you really read it and that you pay attention. Because the rest all make sense. And um, contain, I know when I was initially taking this, because obviously you don't remember everything you read, I was leaning towards A, contain costs by preventing infectious diseases that result in absenteeism and disability. But now with COVID-19, I can definitely, like, I'm not, I would not be selecting that because that has been a huge, um, a huge part of the discussion when it comes to occupational health, employee health, exposures, time off, et cetera. So I'm not going to overlook that, that, um, the importance of that in the future. So immunizations. Um, oh, we did have a comment from somebody that I wanted to share. Um, they said, our occupational health doesn't keep track of immunizations outside of influenza. I was very surprised. So yeah, set some time aside. Just figure out what is your occupational health program doing? How's it going? What are they up to? 
um, ask some questions, get involved, make this information more than words on a piece of paper, like live it, breathe it, do all infection prevention all the time. Immunizations. Immunization programs provide protection from vaccine preventable diseases for both healthcare personnel and those under their care. Vaccine preventable infectious diseases include Hep A and B, influenza, measles, mumps, rubella, tetan <laughs> tetanus, <laughs> pertussis, and varicella zoster. The U.S. Public Health Service Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices addresses recommended immunization practices for vaccinations recommended for healthcare personnel. See Table 101. Okay. So, Table 101, here we are. Table 101. Immunization schedule for healthcare personnel. So we have hepatitis A, laboratory and primate worker, um, hepatitis B, occupational exposure to blood, blood products or bodily secretions, hepatitis A and B, as for hepatitis A and B. <laughs> so you can see that here, this is where they're running down your schedules when it comes to immunization, the recommendations. So influenza, persons attending high risk patients, elderly, um, inactivated vaccine. Ooh, okay. I have I do have a quick question since we're touching on influenza. How are you guys doing with your uh flu compliance? So obviously the majority of us are currently universally masking. And one of the bigger benefits um that people, you know, besides besides you know providing uh protection with the influenza vaccine was that you didn't have to wear a mask if you got your flu shot. How is your compliance at your facilities this year so far? Have you seen a decrease and increase with what's going on? How is everyone doing so far? That's interesting. So a lot of you are saying that there's that there's increase, that they're requesting and taking it the vaccine. 50% compliance so far, mixed it's declining. For some of you, it is declining. There's a decrease. Wow. Yeah, so some of the comments I've heard is, well, if I need to, if I have to wear a mask anyway, then why am I going to get my flu shot? So interesting. I just wanted to know what everybody else was dealing with, but, but I've definitely gotten those comments. So I was wondering if you guys were getting those comments too. All right, so influenza, persons attending high-risk patients, um, inactivated vac vaccine, flu mist, et cetera. All right, next one's MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. Oh, this is a good one. All right, adults born after 1957. So remember remember the year 1957, because they may, they may or they may not ask you, but this will be important for you to remember, just in general, just in general, just as an IP. You should probably know this date, 1957. Adults born after 1957 without a history of physician di diagnosed measles, serological immunity, or documentation of having received two doses of vaccine. So if they were born in 1957, um, sorry, before, before 1957, you're good. Uh, unimmunized women of childbearing age and healthcare personnel for our measles, mumps, and our rubella. Polio. Laboratory and other healthcare personnel who come in contact with the live virus. Um, so TD persons without a history or an unknown history of TD immunization or greater than 10 years since the last dose. And then you have your TDAP, healthcare personnel with direct patient contact, healthy adults 19 to 64, close contacts of those. And then varicella, adults that are non-immune to varicella. So this is a chart that you're going to, sorry, this is a table that you're going to want to make sure you review and that you know. Work, oh, mm, mm, work restrictions. Listen, you heard it here first. You have to know your work restrictions. It is imperative that you know your work restrictions for the CIC exam, and there are a lot of them. There are some that they tend to ask more um, questions about, but you wanna make sure you go over these charts. My recommendation is that you go ahead and make some flashcards because you need to know your work restrictions. Work restrictions may be indicated for workers who present with an illness that may be transmitted in the workplace. So we're not gonna go through all of these, 
but I'll just pick out a few. So conjunctivitis is a famous one. They do ask questions about conjunctivitis. Restrict from patient contact and contact with the patient's environment. Duration until discharge ceases. So that's going to be for conjunctivitis. Cytomegalovirus, we have no restrictions. Diarrheal diseases, so your healthcare staff. This is for your healthcare personnel. What are going to be their work restrictions if they're presenting with these illnesses? So diarrheal diseases, restrict from patient contact, contact with the patient's environment, or food, mm, oh, food handling for sure. Oh, do not let them touch the food. All of the, don't, don't let them do any of this, but specifically food hand. Food, do not. They cannot come near the food. Um, restrict from care of high-risk patients. Diphtheria, exclude from duty. Hepatitis A, restrict from patient contact, contact with the patient's environment and food handling. Um, hepatitis B, no restrictions. Refer to state regulations. Standard precautions should always be observed. Hepatitis C, no recommendation. Herpes simplex, no restriction. Um, genital, restrict from patient contact and contact with the patient's environment. Hands, evaluate for need to restrict from care of high-risk patients. I just said I wasn't going to go over all of those. <laughs> and then I just read the chart. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Um, HIV, do not perform exposure prone invasive procedures until counsel from an expert review panel has been sought. Panels should review and recommend procedures the worker can perform, taking into account specific procedures as well as skill and technique of the worker. Standard precautions should always be observed, referred to state regulations. Measles, if it's active, exclude from duty. Meningococcal infections, exclude from duty. Mumps, exclude from duty. Pediculosis, restrict from patient contact. Pertussis, exclude from duty. Rubella, exclude from duty. Now, this is telling you what you should do, but this is, this is the, the actual um, duration. And, okay, let me tell you what. Measles, they're going to ask you. They're going to ask you about details when it comes to the, the time frame, the duration. So until seven days after the rash appears, from the fifth day after the first exposure through the 21st day after the last exposure and or four days after the rash appears. Keep in mind, they may not, they may not specifically ask you for the day, like for you to say, oh, it's seven days after the rash. Oh, it's through the 21st day. They, they can actually ask you specifics like, Susie Joe was diagnosed with measles. This is their onset. This is what happened, et cetera. This is when the rash started or whatever on this date. And then you have to determine what date they can come back to work. Like it can get to that level of specificity when it comes to occupational health. That's why you do not want to mess around and you want to make sure you read your occupational health chapters. All right. Like, look at this one, mumps, until nine days after onset of para, para, parotitis, parotitis, from the ninth day after the first exposure through the 26th day after the last exposure, or until nine days after onset, right? So, very specific, you have to know this stuff. Rubella, until five days after the rash appears, from the seventh day after the first exposure through the 21st day after the last exposure. All right. Okay, so I know this is a lot, but it doesn't stop there. There's a whole next slide about more. Scabies restrict from patient contact until they're cleared by medical evaluation. So what do we know? We know that we need to go over this table. I cannot cover all of our work restrictions, et cetera, um, during the lesson today, but you need to make sure you study this. All right, tuberculosis. I didn't do well with time today because we only have just a couple of minutes left, but tuberculosis. The three TB screening risk classifications are low risk, medium risk, and potentially ongoing transmission. A TB screening program should include part-time temporary contract and full-time healthcare personnel. Healthcare personnel who have duties that involve face-to-face -face contact with patients with suspected or confirmed TB disease, as well as those involved in the following should also be included. One, entering patient rooms or treatment rooms, whether or not a patient is present. Two, participating in aerosol, 
if I have to read this word. Do you know how many times we've seen this in the last couple of months? Aerosol generating. <laughs> uh, participating in an aerosol generating or aerosol producing procedure. Participating in suspected or confirmed mycobacteria tuberculosis specimen processing or for installing, maintaining, or replacing environmental control in areas which persons with TB are encountered. Okay, latent TB. Latent TB, LTBI, refers to a condition that occurs after initial infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Within two to 12 weeks after the initial infection, the immune response limits additional multiplication of the tubercle bacilli and test results for the M. tuberculosis infection become positive. Certain bacilli remain in the body and viable for multiple years. These persons are asymptomatic and not infectious. Christina said AGP. Ugh, I know. <laughs> I know. Can we, AGPs, can we talk about AGPs? No, absolutely not. Not today. All right, um, latent versus active tuberculosis. This is a pretty helpful chart. So symptoms with latent, you're gonna have none. With active, you have your five classic symptoms of cough with at least three weeks duration, hemoptysis, weight loss, fever, and night sweats. Infectivity, so non-infectious and infectious if you're in the active category. Your tuberculin skin test will be positive for both, interferon gamma release assay positive for both, sputum acid fast bacilli smear will be negative for latent and positive for active, or positive or negative for active, uh, chest radiography, normal or stable calcified granulomas, abnormal findings consistent with active TB, sorry, active tuberculosis infection, and then treatment, consider treatment to prevent progress progression to active disease and then isolation and drug regimen. Okay, tuberculosis testing. Let me have a sip of water. I've been talking a lot. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> the purified protein derivative, PPD, has been used in the United States to diagnose latent TB infection. There are in vitro cytokine-based immunoassays for the detection of M. tuberculosis infection. These tests measure cell-mediated immune response to peptides from two M. tuberculosis proteins that are not present in any bacille calmet garand vaccine strain and are absent from the majority of non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. One such blood assay for M. tuberculosis is the quantiferon TB gold test, which I'm sure y'all see at your facilities getting ordered. Tuberculosis testing continued. A TST should be administered, read, and interpreted by trained personnel. Use the intradermal Mantu method to administer the PPD-based TST. Tie and test should not be used. Baseline screening should be conducted at the time of hire. Those individuals who have a history of having received the BCG vaccination should be included unless they have documentation of a previous positive reaction. A two-step TST should be performed when the initial TST is negative and there is no documented negative TST during the preceding 12 months. Okay, here is our interpretation of the TST uh, of the tuberculin skin test. So interpretation of the TST depends on measured TST in duration in millimeters. The person's risk for being infected with M tuberculosis and risk for progression to active TB if infected. So you have your baseline, your serial testing without known exposure, and then your known exposure. Boom. Positive TST results and next steps. If personnel have a positive TST, a chest radiograph should be done promptly to check for active disease. A history of exposure should be obtained to determine if infection is occupational or community associated. The person should be instructed to report symptoms that are suggestive of TB. Chest radiographs do not need to be repeated unless the person is symptomatic right? They're going to try to trick you when it comes to chest x-rays. So please remember red letters, bold. You don't need to be, you don't need to repeat it unless the person is symptomatic. Unprotected exposure of healthcare personnel to TB. 
there has been unprotected exposure of workers to tuberculosis, TSTs should be administered at the time of the exposure and repeated at 12 weeks post-exposure to look for possible converters. Test x-rays are performed only on those with prior positive TSTs and who are currently symptomatic. Consider retesting immunocompromised personnel at least every six months. Okay, so true or false? Personnel who have laryng laryngeal or pulmonary TB are excluded from work until they are receiving adequate therapy. The cough has resolved and there have been two consecutive sputum smears negative for acid fast bacilli. Is this true or false? Jessica, Jessica and Debbie, why are you guys saying it's false? Yes, Fran, Fran said, I'm coming through with the facts. She said it's three, good job. So it's false. <laughs> you have to have three consecutive sputum smears negative for acid fast bacilli. Boom, good job guys. All right, next one. <laughs> The generally accepted respiratory protection that is used to protect personnel from a person with suspected or confirmed TB is a particulate N95 respirator, a requirement identified in CDC's respiratory protection standard. Is this true or false? <laughs> Whew, okay, some of you are about to be mad. <laughs> okay, so the majority of the group is saying true, but it is false, my friend. Now, 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 let me tell you one way they're going to trick you on this freaking test. All right. This test is very specific about your um, regulatory bodies and you need to know them and whether or not there are requirements or recommendations. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is not a regulatory body. They can have absolutely no requirements for your facility. Now, OSHA can come wreck your stuff, okay? Because they can have requirements. They're a regulatory body. So you need to make sure you know your regulatory bodies. Trust me, these, these agencies align with the CDC messaging. CDC is who we go to, right? As IPs, I mean, let me tell you what, I'm on that CDC webpage multiple times per week, right? So um, I understand how important they are, but they're not regulatory, all right? So this requirement is coming from OSHA. The trick was not particulate N95 respirator or anything else in there. It was requirement, requirement. And I'm tricking you now so that when you're taking your test, they don't trick you. So don't get mad at me, okay? I'm trying to help you. Okay, fill in the blank. So you have two options, qualitative and quantitative. A blank is one that, this is for your fit test. <laughs> I'm just like talking. So you have a qualitative fit test or quantitative fit test. <laughs> um, all right, so the first one, is it qualitative or quantitative? This is um, a blank test test is one that results in a pass or fail fit test and one that assesses the adequacy of respirator fit that relies on the individual's response to the test agent. Okay, everybody said qualitative. Good job. So yes, that's our qualitative fit test. And then our second one is quantitative. 
A quantitative fit test is an assessment of the adequacy of respirator fit by numerically measuring the amount of leakage into the respirator. A user seal check is an action conducted by the respirator user to determine if the respirator is properly seated to the face. Okay, so question six. What action is indicated when the IP is asked to help determine if a worker has experienced occupational acquisition of an infectious agent or disease in order to receive workers' compensation benefit? A, provide enough information to prove or disprove the employee's claim. B, notify the facility's attorney immediately. C, review the workers' compensation system in place. Or D, perform a root cause analysis to investigate. All right, so we have a lot of different answers. We have some A, some Ds, um, A, C, no, two Cs. So there, oh, oh, I'm just over here clicking away. Oh, okay, my bad. So the correct answer is C. You want to review, you, you want to review the workers' compensation system in place. I always had a little bit of difficulty with this one, but um, one of the things that did come up a lot during COVID, which helps me look at this question differently now, is when we were notifying staff of exposures out on the floor, right? Because we had a lot of um, pre-procedural testing. So for anybody going to surgery, they have to get a COVID test. Um, they could be here for neck surgery, whatever, something else. Um, they don't have any symptoms of influenza-like illness, no respiratory complaints, and then Boom, positive, a mess, hot mess express, right? But one of the biggest questions that we kept getting asked by staff were, um, how does this work? And not only staff, but managers. Managers were coming to infection preventionists and saying, what does the compensation look like? Do I need to pay my staff member to be off for this exposure? Is this COVID pay, right? So now I look at this question differently now that I've you know, live through this situation because now I completely understand why this is the answer. You want to review the workers' compensation system in place and you want to make sure you know um, what, what that compensation is going to look like. So why is that IP's job? Isn't it HR's role? Yeah, so we work closely with HR, but I think that you also have to take into consideration that we are kind of like a catch-all. Like there is so much that we need to know. There is so much expertise that we need to know. Um, so that is why this one's the correct answer. So in Canada, this is not our role. Okay. Well, for the test, <laughs> for the test, <laughs> for the test, let's, Let's remember just this one for the test. <laughs> but I'm glad it's not it's not your role. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was so funny. Um, yes, okay. So IPs should be familiar. It's a big long paragraph, but the important part is the very last sentence. <laughs> IPs should be familiar with the workers' compensation system in place within their country. Oh, boom within their country. So hopefully when you take your test in Canada, they'll know, they'll know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stephanie's like, I hate this question so much. <laughs> All right, okay, we're, we're almost done, I promise. I know I'm going over, but I, we did start a little bit late today, so um, technically I'm not really going over. Um, but question seven, which US agency requires a respiratory program for healthcare personnel? A, the Food and Drug Administration, B, the Joint Commission, C, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or D, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Y'all better get this one right. I better see 
the right answer up and down this question box right now. <laughs> you guys cracked me up today. I love it when you get rambunctious like this. It's too much. Okay, so yes, you guys are all correct. It is D. And I'm happy that we all got the correct answer because that means that when I tricked you on that last one, I taught you something and then you're not getting tricked again. Good. So the OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard requires that the employer implement a respiratory protection program with a qualified administrator as the person who oversees the program, including evaluating the effectiveness of the program. The standard also requires the that each worker assigned to wear a respirator receive a fit test before wearing the respirator in the workplace and perform a seal check with each use. Okay, and this is our very last question. Question eight, a technician finds out after obtaining an EKG on a patient that the patient may have varicella zoster on a dermatome on the upper body. The occupational health nurse checks the employee's records and realizes that the employee was never tested for varicella on hire. The first thing the occupational health nurse should do is A, determine if the patient actually has an active case of varicella zoster by involving the IP or checking with the patient's physician to verify the diagnosis. B, test the employee for varicella immunity and, if not immune, exclude them from work from day 10 through day 21. C, give the varicella vaccine to the employee. Or D, give varicella zoster immunoglobulin to the employee. What are we going to do first? So this is very, this one is very similar to our other question. May. Does May may have varicella zoster? May have shingles. Does that seem like enough for you to you know, get the party started? Get the train rolling, get the wheels going. <laughs> Some of you are like, okay, okay, it's A. Yes, good job, guys. It's A. Determine if the patient actually has an active case of varicella zoster by involving the IP or checking with the patient's physician to verify the diagnosis. Once we have that diagnosis verified is when we're going to go ahead and um, get started on our exposure plan. All right, so we're done. Happy Friday. I hope today was fabulous. I hope that you learned something. Um, I will see you guys again soon, next Friday, I'm sure. Um, and yeah, so next week we'll cover we'll cover what we cover. We're scheduled to do boarded teleprotesis and herpes virus, but you know, I'm feeling a little bold. I may decide to do something else. Who knows? It is what it is. So thank you so much. Um, I have not, so so I have to be transparent. I have not changed my email. I have been um, not the best cohort lead. I have not sent out an email. It's on the schedule for this weekend. I do apologize. It's been, it's been a lot. I've been very, um, I've been very overwhelmed with work and preparing for another certification. So you can imagine it's just a lot right now, but on my schedule for today. Um, sometimes it's easier to reach me on LinkedIn. If you have a quick question, you can reach me on LinkedIn. Um, but with over a thousand members, just think about the amount of emails I get at work, plus then the group and then everything else. So it can be quite a bit. So I do apologize if I haven't um, gotten back to you guys, okay? Um, if it's something quick, or even if you just have a question, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm much more accessible through there. Okay, um, and then I'll send out the recordings via email. And you know what? It's on the list for this weekend. It's happening this weekend. Okay, it's happening this weekend, this weekend. I'm gonna manifest it. <laughs> so this weekend you'll get an email. Okay, thank you guys. Have a wonderful weekend and I'll see y'all next week.